Hey everybody, Rob Maurer here, and today we've got an updated note on Tesla from Goldman Sachs. They have lowered their Tesla price target. We've also got updates on Tesla in China and Berlin. We'll talk about the FOMC meeting and a few other items as well. Interesting day in the markets today, even before the FOMC meeting, which of course injected volatility, and we'll talk about that in a second. This morning, Tesla's starting off with a significant underperformance again, and another high volume day, 140 million shares traded. So like we had talked about yesterday, that combination seemed to be suggestive of maybe a larger seller in the market. And then interestingly, about an hour and a half into trading, Tesla started to recover, especially relative to the broader markets. Maybe a sign that if there has been a larger seller over the last couple of days, that perhaps at that point in time, that subsided. Of course, then we head into the FOMC meeting, which of course immediately turns all of the focus and action in the market to that meeting. So with the release, we did see a pretty sharp drop in the market. Definitely not as significant of a drop as we have seen on previous occasions, but a drop nonetheless, Tesla following, then pretty much tracking the volatility in the broader markets through the end of the day, ending up down 2.6% with NASDAQ down three quarters of a percent, Tesla closing at $156.80. So a lot going on there, very high volume. People, of course, still wondering if maybe this is Elon selling. I shared my relatively low conviction opinion on that yesterday, but regardless, we'll find out in the next couple of days when we'll either end up seeing Form 4s that disclose that or not. As for the Federal Open Market Committee meeting, we did see, as expected, the Fed raise rates by half a percent, 50 basis points, moving the targeted rate range to four and a quarter to four and a half percent. Unlike in the November meeting, where we saw some language change in the statement, we did not see any changes this time outside of those rate adjustments. So no major surprises there. And then this time around, the Fed did also release an updated SEP or Summary of Economic Projections. This may be what the market negatively reacted to, if not just the market doing market things and reacting just to react. The SEP, which contains the dot plot, which visualizes FOMC member expectations for interest rates over the next couple of years, does show for the December meeting on the right here, collectively higher interest rate expectations from committee members than the September dot plot indicated the last time the SEP was updated. Personally, I don't think that should be all that surprising either, given that this has increased with each update of the SEP throughout the entirety of the last year. Maybe the dot plot indicates a little bit higher or longer persisting restrictive rates than what the market was expecting, but their expectations certainly have not been a reliable indicator of where things end up going throughout the last year. So I think it's difficult to put too much weight in that. And the Fed has been pretty clear that they're going to continue to react to new data as that comes in. Two other items of note, and this first one may be another cause for the reaction immediately following the release, but the FOMC is now expecting the change in real GDP for 2023 to be just half a percent. It's a pretty significant adjustment from their projection in September of 1.2% for 2023. The FOMC also increased their expectations for the unemployment rate from an expected 4.4% from the September SCP now to 4.6%. Moving into the comments and Q&A from Fed Chair Jerome Powell, these of course always elicit their own little market reaction and we did see a little bit of that today though within a relatively small range. Overall I felt the messaging was pretty consistent with what we've been hearing from him from November and in the interim period. He noted that inflation data has shown a welcome reduction but it's going to take substantially more evidence to be confident that it's on a sustained downward path. He noted that they don't believe that they are at a sufficiently restrictive policy stance yet, which of course the dot plot demonstrates and said, quote, I can't tell you confidently that we won't increase our projection or the peak rate with the next summary of economic projections, end quote. So those would be some of the more hawkish comments or comments that favor a more restrictive policy, but also comments that have been consistent with what Powell's been saying over the last few weeks. As expected, he was asked about 25 or 50 basis point increases for the next meeting, which isn't until February. And I think this answer was more in line with what the market was probably hoping to hear. He said, quote, I think now that we're coming to the end of this year, we've raised 425 basis points this year and we're in a restrictive territory, it's now not so important how fast we go, it's far more important to think what is the ultimate level. And then, at a certain point, the question will become how long do we remain restrictive? That will become the most important question, but I would say the most important question now is no longer the speed, and that applies to February as well." End quote. So my own personal read on that is that there is a pretty significant willingness from the FOMC to just move to 25 basis point increases while allowing for time for the cumulative effect of all the prior rate increases to make their way through the market as long as there are no major surprises in those periods. Later on, Powell even said, quote, we think that the appropriate thing now is to move to a slower pace, end quote. Now contextually, that might have been a slower pace than the 75 basis point increases, which is obviously clear from this being already a slower pace. And of course, he did say that that will depend on the data, but 
The sense that I get after listening to all of these over the last many months is that they're kind of ready to move to that level. Of course, then a few other comments just to make sure no one overreacts and gets too excited about that, emphasizing that the committee in general feels that rates are going to have to stay high for quite some time, and that they haven't really given any thought or consideration to the possibility of cutting rates in 2023. Now, of course, things change, but that's where they're at right now. All right, moving into Tesla-specific news, we've got an updated note from Goldman Sachs on the automotive industry late last night. In that note, they updated some of their expectations for Tesla, including a pretty significant price target adjustment. Previously, their price target for Tesla was $305 per share. They have now updated that to $235 per share. I had to kind of laugh a little bit at how they kicked off the note. They talk about how they believe that in general in the automotive industry, investor focus is shifting to better understand and assess company earnings potential in the intermediate to long term from key applications like battery electric vehicles and autonomy slash ADAS rather than placing value on high level company plans. I mean, you could pretty much just write that we're transitioning from a bullish market into a bearish market. And that's, I think, been happening for a long time. So nothing too surprising there, but they do kind of use that to justify a change to their Tesla model. They say that they are now switching to a price to earnings based price target rather than previously. They had been using price to sales, which has probably been outdated for Tesla for a long time. Anyway, as far as their earnings estimates go, they have lowered those for 2023, 2024 by roughly 10% from prior, which they say is on lower units, lower vehicle average selling prices, and lower margins. They say that with their expectations for 25% compound annual growth rate for earnings per share that they model for Tesla, that it should carry about a 45 times price to earnings multiple, which yields their $235 price target when applied to their EPS projection for Q5 to Q8. Q5 to Q8 here would just mean the forward 12 month earnings one year from today. One year from today, of course, would be when the price target is four. So basically, they're just saying it should be priced at 45 times forward earnings. Perhaps not unreasonable, especially in a market like this, but figuring out what those earnings are going to be, that is a larger question. Goldman Sachs is modeling for 1.85 million units in 2023, working up to 2.7 million units in 2025. Giving some insight into the general concerns that Wall Street has on long-term growth right now, they say that, quote, we believe our reduced estimates are consistent with the added incentives and price reductions for certain Tesla vehicles this quarter, reduced wait times, and soft macro indicators such as consumer sentiment and housing slash property data. Although comments from Tesla on its potential factory capacity ramps would suggest that 2023 production could reach about 2.4 million vehicles, and therefore Tesla could theoretically meet consensus estimates for 2023 deliveries of about 1.9 to 2 million units even if media reports such as from Reuters about Tesla lowering China production by 20% were true, the fact that macro indicators in several regions are moderating and Tesla is pulling multiple demand levers suggests that global supply slash demand is now softer for Tesla. End quote. So these are kind of the first concerns they mentioned. They then go on to mention some things that could be benefits on the cost reduction side. Ultimately noting though, however, the degree to which these levers will help volume and the cost to Tesla to achieve them will be key to monitor. So throughout this entire note, it should be pretty clear that we're in a period of skepticism right now. People are worried about volume and demand and margins and things like that. And they acknowledge that there might be some things within cost to offset those, but are not willing to give Tesla credit for that at this point in time. Ultimately, in a skeptical market like this, I think Tesla is going to have to prove those things out in the financials. Finally then, and maybe interestingly, after these other things were mentioned, Goldman Sachs does note media reporting that with Elon Musk's takeover of Twitter and more active engagement in political topics, Tesla's brand has become more polarizing. They say that they do believe that Tesla's brand has significant value, so having consumer focus related to Tesla shift back to the core attributes of sustainability and technology will be important in their view if Tesla is to meet or exceed long-term investor expectations. Last thing from the note, just kind of an interesting table here from Goldman Sachs. They show a bunch of different auto companies and their price based on Goldman Sachs expectations for their earnings per share from electric vehicles or ADAS in 2025. And although Tesla's valuation often gets criticized as being quite high, it is actually the lowest on this table in terms of that multiple. It's also interesting because I think their forecast for Tesla is probably quite low and their forecast for Ford and GM, which I don't really expect to be making a ton of money from EVs that soon, is probably a little bit high. All right, next we've got an update on Giga Berlin. This is coming from Moz.de. They are reporting that they have learned that Tesla will be starting their three-shift operation at Giga Berlin this Friday, December 16th. They say that the first shift will start at 6 a.m., the second at 2 p.m., and the new third shift at 10 p.m. They note that the addition of this third shift would mean that production at Giga Berlin would be operating 24 hours a day, at least during weekdays. TeslaMeg.de added a little bit of context to this report. They say that the current goal is 300 vehicles per shift, 
So three shifts, five days would be 4,500 model Ys potentially per week. Now, before we get too excited about that, I do still lack some clarity on this because in addition to that context, Tesla Meg also posted an update in which they say, quote, in addition, it was said on Wednesday from the factory environment that a third shift in the logistics area will start there this week. The night shift and final assembly should not begin until the second week of January, end quote. So there's been so much back and forth reporting on this third shift over the last few months when it would start, whether that's Q4, Q1, Q4, Q1, it's just ping-ponged back and forth. That seems to even be happening within these reports today. So I don't really know how to interpret this. Maybe Maz.de was just reporting on that logistics shift, although they did say 24-hour production, so that would be somewhat inaccurate. Hopefully we'll get a little bit more clarity on what exactly is going on here over the next couple of days, and I'll keep an eye out for any updates on that. Next, we've got a couple of quick updates on Tesla in China. First, from Moneyball on Twitter, citing a source called BK Economy, which I was not able to find the original source material on, but Moneyball from that source, saying that Tesla, on rumors of Giga Shanghai Model Y production halt from December 25th through January 1st, and plans of about 20,000 Model Y production until year end, are false. I also came across a similar report from Beijing News that on December 14th, Tesla told the Shell Finance reporter that the above rumor, same rumor, was not true. So my assumption is that both of these reports are based on the same source information, would love to verify that, and would love to have more information on how that source is described exactly, like we had talked about with the Tasmanian report earlier this week. So hopefully these denials are accurate. I think it's difficult to know how much weight to assign to those without a little bit more context. And then also on China, as a follow-up to what we had talked about yesterday with expectations for China to decide on some stimulus efforts for 2023 sometime this month, We do have a Bloomberg headline today that was shared on Twitter, which says, quote, China will encourage change of auto consumption, promote electric vehicles, internet of vehicles, end quote. Obviously, we'll have to wait to hear more on that, but could be some good news for EVs in China on the horizon. All right, last few items here, one of which is a Tesla shop item. Tesla has introduced a new one terabyte solid state drive into the Tesla shop on the heels of the holiday update yesterday that introduced Steam to some Tesla vehicles. It is relatively pricey at $350, and availability begins in February 2023. Next, we've got an update on the EV market in Indonesia. Who knows what we may see from Tesla there someday, but the Minister of Industry for Indonesia announced that the government intends to offer a subsidy of more than $5,000 on the sale of electric cars, provided that those are produced by firms with factories in Indonesia. So again, maybe not relevant to Tesla right now, but who knows what will happen with Indonesia someday. Lastly, today we have an announcement from former Tesla CTO and co-founder J.B. Straubel's new company Redwood Materials, which has announced plans for what they are calling their next battery materials campus in South Carolina. They say this location will be recycling, refining, and manufacturing anode and cathode components on more than 600 acres, creating more than 1,500 jobs, and investing $3.5 billion in the local community. Eventually, they expect this campus will produce 100 gigawatt hours of cathode and anode components per year but they note that the site also provides the opportunity to expand their operations to potentially several hundred gigawatt hours to meet future demand. They are wasting no time on this. They plan to break ground in Q1 2023 and have recycling processes up and running by the end of next year. Sounding like some pretty Tesla-esque speed there from Redwood Materials, so it'll be really exciting to follow that. But that'll wrap it up for today. So as always, thank you for listening. Make sure you're subscribed and signed up for notifications. Also find me on Twitter at Tesla Podcast. And we'll see you tomorrow for the Thursday, December 15th episode of Tesla Daily. Thank you.